Tyler Burke from T1 MMA. So, UFC 216, what a fantastic card that ended up being. You know, from the bottom of the card with Talos Leites and Brad Tavares, it, all the way up to the top with Tony Ferguson and Kevin Lee, what a fantastic card it was, and what an exciting card. But So, I just want to wrap that up. UFC 216, uh, overall, very good card, actually. You know, a lot of people, this this event didn't get the proper hype that I thought it should have because it, it was a pretty stat card. Obviously, Derek Lewis fell out, and that was a huge bummer. But look at the balls on Walt Harris. Taking that fight on five hours' notice, it didn't go his way. Really, nothing went right for him in that fight. And that shows the, the high level of heavyweights that we have now. You know, there's a huge step up from someone like Walt Harris, who was unranked in the heavyweight division, all the way up to Fabrizio Verdun, but I'll get to that in a minute. Two draws overall on the card. I can't remember the last time that has happened in a UFC event. There's a whopping two draws, so that was abs that was actually kind of weird. One of those draws was Lando Venata versus Bobby Green, and holy crap, what a fight that was. You know, both of those guys delivered. Um, looking at the stats right here in front of me, there, there's one typo. It says he had 59 minutes of control time. That's wrong. Lana Venata had one knockdown, 111 strikes, and 104 significant strikes. Bobby Green, two minutes and 30 seconds of control, zero knockdowns, 104 total strikes, and 93 significant strikes. And there obviously was uh, an illegal knee at the at the in the first round, I believe. So I think that fight was that first round was obviously scored a 9-9. But what a way to end the fight! Bobby Green rocked Lana Venata in the last in the waning seconds of the round. And who knows, that had happened 30 seconds earlier. Bobby Green might have came out a winner by knockout in that fight. That's how crazy that fight was. And then another draw was Benio Darush versus Evan Dunham. And that fight delivered as well. That was a fantastic fight as well. You know, I, I believe knockout of the night in this fight was crazy. This knockout was crazy. John Moraga knocked out Mango Man Baby Lotto, which I was not expecting. And that's, that's certainly great for John Moraga because he needed a big victory over a, a big opponent in Mega Man Baby Lotto because that was his first loss in his entire career. I believe he went 14-0 and before that. And for John Moraga to knock him out in 14 seconds, I loved his post-fight interview as well. He goes, yeah, I'm not very good at interviews. So, I mean, I knocked him out. <laughs> so that was, that was very cool. And he was just overwhelmed with emotions because if he had lost that fight... You know, he had gone one and three in that at that before that fight came up, and if he had lost that fight, that would have been very bad. Because at one point he was fighting the highest level of competition. You know, he was fight he faced Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson. He was facing the top ten for sure. And what an opportunity it was for Mega Man Bibulatov. It what didn't go his way, but now that he's got that exposure to that high level, it'll certainly be interesting to see what he can bring in the future. And then the next, next fight was Matt Schnell versus Marco Beltran. That didn't really live up to expectations. Pearl Gonzalez and uh, Poliana Botello. That fight was interesting. It was interesting because it, it didn't really deliver as well as I'd hoped it would. And uh, Poliana Botello won her first, uh, first victory. That wasn't a knockout, so that was actually kind of interesting. But Pearl Gonzalez, her game plan... It's one of the strangest game plans that I've ever that I've ever seen. She had 10 minutes and 18 seconds of control time because her whole game plan was to put Bo Poliana Botello up against the cage. And I'm not sure. I kind of noticed immediately that that wasn't working because Poliana was doing way more damage. She was landing elbows. She was doing everything she could. She was landing more more shots. 157 total strikes to Pearl Gonzalez's 89. Not even close. And that's just not a way to win a fight. She tried holding on to her opponent for all three rounds, and it just didn't work. You know, I believe that every single judge had it 30-27. It just didn't work. I'm not sure exactly if that was more her decision or more her coach's decision. That was really weird to see. And then uh, Tom Dukanoi versus Cody Stammen. That was a decent fight. Cody Stammen won, I'd say, pretty dominantly. And uh, a big victory for him. Now he's 16-1 and over a big opponent in Tom Dukanoi, who was also 15-1 and at the time. Now he's 15-2. and so that's a big victory for him, and that's in the 135-pound division. And what a division that is. That's just crawling with up-and-comers. Like I said before, it was like Cody Garver and just yesterday it was just one of those young guys coming up, you know, young, undefeated talent. And right now, he's the title holder. A lot of people didn't give him a shot against Takeo Mizugaki. A lot of people didn't give him a shot against Dimit or um, Dominic Cruz. excuse me. And speaking of that, I'll get to that in, in, in a minute. Uh, Mauro Romero... Uh, Borella, that's a hard name to say. She ended up winning her fight by uh, submission. I can't remember. 
I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but round one, she's the first women's fighter, uh, women's Italian fighter in the UFC. So congrats to her. And uh, yeah, basically it, it was really spectacular to watch. Watching what the UFC did. I'm going to wrap this entire event up. Obviously, considering what happened in Las Vegas and what a huge tragedy it was, you know, it's it's one of the saddest. I can't think of any, really anything worse, you know, considering what that guy did and what a cowardly move it is for him to decide to end it all. You know how cowardly that is to end it all as well. By the way, I say cowardly, you know, the way that he did it, taking out 58 innocent people with him, some as young as 20 years old. That is absolutely unbelievably ridiculous and it's it's frustrating it's sad and how much the ufc supported the first responders how much the ufc supported the people that were injured it was truly touching and that shows the integrity that the ufc has i'm not going to dive into too many politics but you see what's going on in the nfl and how they're not really supporting the first responders you know you haven't heard anything in fact they're i don't want to get too deep into this because i don't want to stir up any controversy because one thing I love about fighting is that you can put all the politics aside. You either win your fight or you don't. You know, there's no politics. There's no. There's nothing. It's just go in there, sell yourself, and fight. That's what I love about mixed martial arts, and that's what we're. Kind of, that's what I used to love about sports as well. But now we're kind of moving away from that. UFC handled this situation perfectly, better than any other organization has ever had. Any sports organization ever had. You know. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now that's saying America the Beautiful. And that was absolutely incredible. That was touching. And before that, uh, it was his idea. I'm trying to remember what his name was. But um, it was his idea not to do the national anthem because um, of what's going on in the NFL right now. Because that will only cause division. His words, not mine. It will only cause division. And it will cause up a lot of controversy when right now we need unity. And him singing America the Beautiful was absolutely incredible. And that was one of the most touching moments that the UFC has ever had. And everything that they were doing, you know, with all the octagon girls wearing, it, all the fighters, including, were wearing Vegas Strong. You know, they had this tribute to all the people that were injured. They had a huge section of, like, I think it was 1,500 seats filled with just first responders, with people that were injured in the attacks. It was truly incredible. And with Dana White giving $1 million of his own money to support these people, was absolutely touching and absolutely incredible. It was what is great about the UFC. You see the ESPN, you know, trying to write BS articles about trying to bash the UFC for God knows what because they're competitors, to be honest with you, but I won't get into that right now. And that was truly touching. And it, it's something that I wish we had more of in sports and in politics today because immediately people started, instead of just reaching out to the people you know obviously there was thousands thousands of people responding giving blood doing whatever they could to help the victims you know there was up to 500 injured that's absolutely insane 500 victims and for the amount of outreach that the people in las vegas had it sh truly showed how strong of a city that is and that's what i have tremendous respect for i kind of yeah yeah um immediately what Fo what the news channels fox news cnn you know, politicians, they were all blaming something. They were all blaming this to try to push their own political agendas, which in my opinion is absolutely inappropriate considering what happened. The UFC put politics aside. You know, there was no kneeling to the national anthem. There was no none of that. It was just to support the people, the law enforcement that risked their lives to stop this stop this crime. And it's it was absolutely touching. And that was absolutely incredible. And that's what I love loved about this event and this event didn't really get the proper uh build up that i thought it should because in this main event tony ferguson versus kevin lee the winner of this fight from what i know i don't want to release it right now because it's not it's not written in stone but conor mcgregor's next fight if he ever fights again in the ufc would be against the winner of this fight and tony ferguson ended up coming out ahead but before i get to that switching gears here i want to talk about how big of a monster demetrius mighty mouse johnson is how big of a freak is this guy? This was absolutely incredible. Look at these stats right here. 172 total strikes for Demetrius Mighty Moss Johnson compared to Ray Borg's only 13 significant strikes. That is absolutely un outrageous. Round five, three minutes into round five. And he's able to put that much damage on his opponent, just systematically break him down. You know, 
there's there's this different kind of domination between Fabricio Verdum and Walt Harris, and that was actually incredible to watch as well, but I'll get to that later. Uh, for Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson, for what he's been able to do in the UFC, how dominant he has been. Arguably, the only um, his only somewhat of a challenge was Ian McCall, Dominic Cruz, obviously, but since he had this long title run, was uh, Tim Elliott. And that was just kind of a freak, freak, freaky thing to happen, actually. For him to systematically break down Ray Borg the way that he did it was absolutely outstanding. He's been able to do that to every single opponent that he has faced. Pretty much every single opponent. He's just been able to break them down in the striking, in the grappling, in the jiu-jitsu. It's absolutely un- incredible and something that we've never seen in the UFC. And... For him not to get the proper attention that he has had that he has is actually pretty sad. But what I like about Demetrius Johnson, he's not a whiner. He's not a complainer. He's not like saying, Oh, I want more money. People need to like me or try to pull out the race card like Tyron Woodley did. I probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, he didn't make excuses. He's like, I put on good fights, the fans will like him, or they won't. And that's it. And that's what's absolutely incredible about him. And he just goes out there, does his thing, and that's what kind of He's kind of building up momentum now. He's kind of building up. People are starting to realize, wow, this guy is a freak of nature. After the finish that he had, he had a suplex. He threw Ray Bork up in the air. And like, I don't even know how to explain it. He just grabbed his arm while he's falling down and arm bars him. Something that we haven't seen. And it's absolutely, truly incredible. Absolutely, truly incredible. And the, the domination that he put up against Ray Borg, you know, I was always kind of like, eh, this is kind of an underdog fight for Ray Bork. With all due respect, Ray Bork came out there to fight, and you know he held out on that armbar. That showed the toughness that Ray Bork has, and for him to keep going after being just dominated like that, and not losing his cool. You know, I'm a hockey player. I haven't, I've, I've done some jujitsu tournaments, but I haven't done enough to understand what he's going through. But I'm a hockey player. I'm actually a goalie, and w- when you get to that level, it's kind of like having eight goals scored on you, nine goals scored on you. And, you know, you, it gets to your head. You get frustrated. He stayed in there. He was in it to win it the entire time, but he was just in there with a a, a monster in Demetrius Johnson. And that begs the question, is he truly the greatest of all time? I personally think so. With everything that he's been able to do in the UFC, it's absolutely incredible. You know, he really hasn't had any real competition. And that's one thing that I wish that Demetrius Johnson would do. I wish that he would take wild chances like Conor McGregor would, like some of these freak athletes would, and he just hasn't had the proper competition like these people that would sell these pay-per-views has. And that's one problem because he's he's not able to sell pay-per-views. I think he had actually the lowest pay-per-view sell in modern UFC history, which is really sad, but... I mean, what are you going to do? He's fighting Ray Borg, who's really not that big a name. He's, he's not this stellar athlete like a John Jones, not like a Daniel Cormier. You know, how big of a rivalry they had, Chael Sonnen and Anderson Silva. He just hasn't had the high-level competition. Even Anderson Silva, when he went on excuse me, when he went on his long title run, he went up a weight class. He fought Forrest Griffin. He fought Stefan Bonner. He fought out of his weight class to go fight those people and absolutely dominated in, in, in dramatic fashion. And... And that's just something that we haven't seen from Demetrius Johnson. And one thing that just kind of frustrated me was when they offered the fight to DJ of TJ Dillashaw. You know, I didn't really agree with that fight either. So I have somewhat respect for him. But you got to take that fight because right now, you know, it's kind of a similar thing with John Jones back in the day against uh, Chael Sonnen. When Chael, when Chael stepped up and said, I will fight Demetrius, or I'll fight John Jones on short notice. Give me that fight. And John Jones was like, no, I can't take that fight. In my mind, maybe it was because I was a Chael Sonnen fan back then. It just seemed kind of like a loss to John Jones in a weird way because he just he absolutely flat out declined to fight him, and that makes him look like a coward. And it just it it shows that he had some worry. And for Demetrius Johnson to flat out, you know, no belts involved, you know, not he's not jumping up a weight class. It's T.J. Dillashaw coming down to fight him. That, that was kind of weird, and it was kind of interesting to see, and that's just something that we haven't seen from a champion before. He just did not, completely denied a fight. I'm not talking down about Demetrius Johnson, by the way. He is far and away the greatest of all time, and I wish I wish that we could see him jump up a weight class or have some pe- people go down. It'd be interesting to see because he's relatively healthy. He's young. I think he's 31, and he hasn't taken damage that someone like Chuck Liddell had in, in his long title run. 
uh, he hasn't taken the pro the damage that Anderson Silva had. Heck, we could probably see another 11 fights. That as crazy as that sounds, he could defend that de that belt if he keeps improving the way that he's been improving and he keeps his health and he doesn't take the proper damage that someone like Anderson Silva, Chuck Liddell, and some of those other former dominant champions had. We could see him fight for another 11 fights. Could you imagine that? Someone defending the belt 22 times, that's absolutely unbelievable. And that's what he is going for. But people necess don't necessarily like to see that. Because in the 125-pound division, we are kind of seeing a shift between some of these younger guys coming up and some of the older guys coming down. And it, it, one of those cases was uh, Megamed Bibulatov and John Moraga. But John Moraga proved that the old guys can still hang in there as well. But... Um, you, I mean, you're just not going to have that proper competition. And I still have one theory of why, you know, you look at the flyweight division. There's only been one champion in the flyweight division, and he's been able to defend that belt 11 times. He's obviously a freak athlete. I'm not saying, I'm not talking down about him at, at all. But when you look at the heavyweight division, the longest reigning champion defended the belt two times, and that's been tied by multiple people. And Stipe Miocic is, is looking somewhat sometime in the future. They haven't announced when his next fight is. Sometime in the future, defending his belt for a third time. Historic for the heavyweight division. But in the heavyweight division, you're you're fighting heavyweights. You're fighting guys where a fight can end like that just so quickly. You saw that with Fabricio Verdum against uh, Stipe. A fight can end just like that if you get if you if you uh, make a tiny mistake. In the 125 pound division, these guys are a lot lighter. These guys don't hit quite as hard as the heavyweights. And so fights can't end these freakish ways. And I'm not talking bad about him at all. I'm going to rephrase that many, many times. Because in fights, even at the flyweight division, you can make mistakes. You can make a mistake. You know, he fought a black belt in jiu-jitsu in his last fight against Wilson Haiz. And um, he could have easily been caught up in his guard. He was trying to pass or something. His arm gets stuck and he, got, he, gets, a tri he gets triangled. That could have easily happened. You know, he fights Henry Cejudo. Henry Cejudo just knocked out his last opponent. I made a mistake. That could have easily happened to him as well. For him to not make a single mistake that cost him a fight, he hasn't really made any mistakes that cost him anything. That's how incredible Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson is. It's absolutely insane. And, you know, I am truly lucky because I've been able to, you know, when I first got into MMA, it was right after UFC 100, to be honest. It was right around UFC 2, 100, excuse me, uh, you know, I grew I, I grew up in South Dakota. I still live in South Dakota. And so I was a huge fan of Brock Lesnar. And he's what brought me to the sport. I know people hate those Brock Lesnar fans, but I was one of those guys. And and I wasn't able to see the start of Anderson Silva's career. I wasn't able to see the start of Chuck Liddell's. I wasn't able to see the start of George St. Pierre's, Matt Hughes's, all these dominant champions. I wasn't able to see that. For Demetrius Johnson, I watched his first title fight. I can't remember who it was against for the for the life of me. I can't remember. But throughout, since I've been a fan, I've been able to. When I started watching UFC, there wasn't even a 125 pound division. There wasn't even a 145 pound division. 135. We haven't had any of those divisions. It was Uriah Faber that really brought that to the map uh, in WEC. You know that was the only place you saw that. And for Demetrius Johnson, for winning the inaugural fight. For the flyweight championship, I believe that was back in 2011. I might be wrong, and we're now we're here in 2017 to still be champion is absolutely incredible, and I'm truly honored to see that because I, I I missed out on so much. I, you know, I missed out on the long reigns of Fedor Emelianenko. I I missed when Krokop was uh, knocking people out. And I missed a lot of that with Demetrius Johnson. We're seeing a living legend. We're seeing a living legend, and he, what's crazy is he's just getting started. You know, he. He keeps improving at this incredible rate. You know, he's got one of the best coaches and Matt Matt Hume of all people, uh, who fought back in the early days of the UFC. Um, he just keeps on improving. That's what Matt Hume is talking about. He's never seen a guy like that. He he's already defended the belt eleven times. He's already the greatest of all time, and he's still just making leaps and bounds. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I've talked long enough. He won performance of the night for submission and probably submission of the year, to be honest. I've never seen anything like that. For someone to throw someone up in the air, catch his arm, and get him in an arm bar was absolutely, absolutely incredible. So all I got to say is Demetrius Johnson, he is a hero. Uh, absolutely incredible. But on to the next, th on to the next event. 
or the next fight, the interim lightweight title between Tony Ferguson and Kevin Lee. What a fight that was. That was a back and forth war. Kevin Lee actually outstruck Tony Ferguson for what I'm seeing here. And Kevin Lee did a lot better than I thought he would. Plus, he had to cut weight, a ton of weight, 19 pounds on the last day, and he had to cut an extra one pound. He had an hour allowance, and he had to cut one more pound, and that's brutal for anyone that's ever cut weight before. I personally actually have not cut weight before for a fight. You know, I've had to lose like a pound or something like that. Uh, I've never cut 19 pounds in a day. That's incredible. And uh, Ariel Homani brought up we should have more weight classes, but I'll get to that in a minute. And Kevin Lee had staph infection. Why didn't the athletic commission notice that? What what was going on there? They should not allow someone with staph infection to fight in the octagon. That was crazy. That was crazy weird. You know, the athletic commission did all these medical tests. USADA did all of these medical tests. And I noticed it immediately when he took his shirt off. And Joe, and, uh, Joe Rogan noticed immediately when he took his shirt off. I don't know what it was. Even looking at the picture now, this was a couple days ago when they took this picture. I could still see something right there. He had staph infection. And for so, so, that, someone that has staph infection, I, I don't think he was on antibiotics though. But that can really mess with your cardio. And that was one thing that Kevin Lee always had to strengthen was his cardio. And – but – on a, on a level of Tony Ferguson, ugh. and for him cutting 19 pounds, it was honestly a miracle that he was able to make it three rounds going the pace that he did and beating Tony Ferguson, arguably. And, you know, Tony Ferguson is just just a stud. He is just a stud. He is tough. He is long, lanky. He's got killer jiu-jitsu training with uh, Eddie Bravo at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. He's got this this crazy striking style. He's awkward. He's he's weird. What's that? What's not there to love about him? You know, he can be cringy at some times. That's what makes him almost fun to watch. He's he can be cringy. You know, the way that he talks, the way that he acts. You know, you see you could see him. He's dancing in a suit, doing. I think it was Man in Black. It was just hilarious. It was just hilarious to watch. And for him to do what he did to Kevin Lee was absolutely incredible. And the big elephant in the room here is. What's going to happen with Conor McGregor? What's going to happen with Conor McGregor? I've heard a bunch of rumors that Conor McGregor was going to probably fight Nate Diaz next. That's what I honestly thought was going to happen. Uh, but Dana White says that's a complete lie. They haven't done any business with uh, Nate Diaz. And it doesn't really surprise me. Nate Diaz doesn't want anything to do with the UFC right now unless they bring in the Conor fight. One fight that I do want to see, this is just a dream fight. It's not going to happen. And this is just completely off topic. Tony Ferguson versus Nate Diaz would be one hell of a fight. That would be an absolute, they're both very similar. They're both highly conditioned. They're both long, lanky. They have killer jiu-jitsu. What a fight that would be. Come on. What a fight that would be. But anyway, Tony Ferguson versus Conor is probably what's going to happen next for to unify the belt if Conor will ever fight again. Now, Conor might just go AWOL and just go boxing. He might fight Paul, Mon Paul Na Malinaji, excuse me. He might fight Floyd Mayweather again. Who knows? Uh, who knows with Conor McGregor? It was such, it's such a weird situation. Obviously, he just made a ton of money. More money than he will ever make in the UFC off of one fight anyway. <clears throat> but you never know. You never know. He could go on this long title run and start building momentum again. But I'm pretty sure we kept seeing this with Conor. He's going up, 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 up. And I'm pretty sure we're just reaching a point. And I'm not sure... If anyone can reach the point of Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather, that did a whopping six million pay-per-view buys. Six million. That's absolutely insane. That's based on projections that I that came out immediately after the fight. So I'm not sure if that's true. But could you imagine six million pay-per-view buys? The next best was Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao, and that did four million. I never thought four million would be broken in a million billion years because the next one was. Oscar De La Hoya versus Floyd Mayweather, and that did 2 million buys. And the next one was Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz that did 1.7 or something like that. So for them to do 6 million pay-per-view buys, I think Conor McGregor's walking away. I think I'm not really sure exactly how much he made. I think it was somewhere like 30 to 50 million. I think he could have made a lot more, by the way, and Floyd walked out there with buckets of cash. The, the gate didn't do as well. That did like 50 million compared to... Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather, that one did like $75 million, but the pay-per-view record was blown out of the water. But they did have that problem with the UFC.TV stuff, but, or the UFC app, how that crashed because of the um, overactivity. But if Conor McGregor will ever fight again in the UFC, it will be against Tony Ferguson. That's my prediction. That's what should happen. That's what's fair to the division. 
you can't lock up the division anymore. We'll see what happens with Khabib. You know, Khabib could fight Kevin Lee. There's so many other fighters. One fight that I'm looking forward to in the lightweight division is Justin Gaethje versus, uh, darn, Eddie Alvarez. Eddie Alvarez. What a fight that will be. That fight will be absolutely incredible, and it will certainly impact the future rankings for 1,000%. Because the winner of that, that fight, we'll have to see what happens. And then another fight coming up, it's... Uh, who is it? Anthony Pettis versus... Who's Anthony Pettis fighting? I'll have to look at the schedule here. Versus Dustin Poirier. That's going to be a good fight as well. And that will certainly impact the lightweight ranking. So, you know, ever since Conor went AWOL and went boxing, which I was in support for, I, I'm not talking bad about that at all because that was absolutely incredible to watch. It was a freak show. That's why it was fun. But anyway, what was I talking about? Tony Ferguson. Um... Yeah, if Conor were to come back, you know, there's rumors of Paul Malignaggi, and I think that's just a, a a lie. You know, I don't even want to see that fight. After seeing Conor box Floyd, you know, I just don't really want to see it again because obviously it was such a great fight and that sold very well. Boxing just doesn't does just doesn't excite me as much as MMA does. And, you know, I bought the um, Gennady Glovkin and Canelo Alvarez fight. What a bummer that was, by the way. And it just doesn't excite me as much as. You know, even Tony Ferguson versus Kevin Lee. It just doesn't excite me as much. I love mixed martial arts. And I love boxing, too. I'm not talking bad about boxing as well. But one sport that's actually making a comeback is kickboxing. I love watching kickboxing. Glory kickboxing. That's going to make a comeback here pretty soon. Because Bellator has kickboxing fights. Glory is now on ESPN, I'm pretty sure. I just recently saw that. And it's also on uh, on the UFC app. Look out for kickboxing as well because that's making a comeback as well, and that's extremely fun. If you haven't watched a kickboxing event, go watch a kickboxing event because that's a lot of fun to watch. But anyway, um, Conor McGregor, if he ever fights in the UFC again, it should be against Tony Ferguson. That's the right thing to happen, and that's what should happen. Conor McGregor hasn't defended his belt yet compared to Demetrius Mighty Johnson who's defended 11 times. He needs to defend his belt. That's what should happen. He needs to defend the belt or vacate it. That's what should happen. And as I'm, a, I'm always one for money fights. I love watching money fights. I love, I love having huge fights. You know, especially McGregor Diaz, McGregor Mayweather. I love all of those. But now it's time to get back to reality. You need to get back, step back to what's real. And what's real is Conor McGregor versus Tony Ferguson. We need to figure out what's going on with Habib Nurmagomedov. We need. They really need to screen him to make sure he can get back down to 155 safely because. Uh, the UFC Performance Institute is always helping fighters get make weight. Kevin Lee actually denied it from uh, per Dana White. He denied it, and that's why he kind of struggled with uh, weight cuts. And they'll tell you, even the athletic commissions will work with you now. If you can't make the weight, we're not going to let you fight. And that's what Habib needs to figure out, if he can make the weight. And obviously, he didn't really take good care of himself while he was cutting weight. And, you know, there's rumors. Actually, is I think it's actually been confirmed that he was eating uh, tiramisu. If I'm pronouncing that right, I've never had it before. Some some kind of dessert before a fight, and that's just unprofessional behavior, and that shouldn't be happening. And he needs to get back in the 155 pound division because he is a killer. 24 and 0. No, that's never been done before. 24 and 0. And could you imagine Connor versus Khabib in Russia? Could you imagine? Could you imagine that? That might start a war between Ireland and Russia, because Russia. I'm not sure if you. If you follow Instagram, I'm very active on Instagram. And if you just look at all the MMA highlights and stuff, there's always edits out there. They're all in Russian. And they're all Habib fans. You know, Habib, Habib. It's crazy. He's got such a following in Russia and that people don't even know about. He's a superstar in Russia. Not a lot of people know about that. And if Conor McGregor went into enemy territory to fight Habib, that would be insane. It'd be like Rocky IV, except he's Irish be just like that so anyway tony ferguson the right thing to happen is a fight against conor mcgregor and i personally think that will happen i think that will happen sooner rather than later i think that will happen before the end of the year that's what dana white was trying to do i think that will happen let's see the cards coming up it won't happen anytime soon it will happen if i had to guess it'd be on the december card the late december card you know the UFC 207 was the last one. That would be absolutely insane as well because that would be a, a year anniversary. I started this podcast December 26th. This was the day after Christmas. I started this podcast t- December 26th, filmed my fir- first one, and for it to come all the way around, and then Conor McGregor versus Tony Ferguson, that'd be really cool. And um, 
that's what's probably going to happen, to be quite honest. I'm not reporting anything here. This isn't news. I'm not saying breaking news, Conor McGregor versus Tony Ferguson. No, 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 no. This is all speculation. We won't know for sure yet unless it comes out of the boss's mouth. Dana White will let us know. We might hear some leaks. We might hear some rumors before it. But from my understanding, the next fight for Tony Ferguson would be Tony versus Conor. And that fight will sell very well, let me tell you. Because Tony Ferguson, he's a sell as well. And he might have the biggest threat, the biggest threat to Conor McGregor. There hasn't really been anyone besides Nate Diaz that's really given Conor McGregor any difficulty in the octagon. Tony Ferguson is built. He fights just like he fights just like uh, Nate Diaz. He's very similar. He's got the cardio. He's got the heart. You know, but who knows? Can his chin hold up to the power of Conor McGregor? We'll have to see. And you know what happens from there happens. If Tony wins, he's a superstar. If Conor loses. His star is fading out. He might end up like a Ronda Rousey sort of, except he might even have, he, he has a lot more money because of Floyd Mayweather. But anyway, Tony Ferguson versus Conor McGregor. I'm calling it late December. What's the late December card? I'm sure they have it announced. It's TBD versus TBD right now. And you might hear it here first. UFC 219, Saturday, December 30th in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. That is my guess, Tony Ferguson versus Conor McGregor for the unified for the unified title. And one one thing before I go, I wanted to talk about how insane Fabrizio Verdum looked. And that was a real what's what's the word I'm looking for here? Is a real reality check for how high level these fighters are. Walt Harris, with all due respect to him. Walt Harris versus the Hand of God beer. What a fight that would have been. And Derek Lewis versus uh, Fabrizio Verdum. I might go out of limb and say that fight might have ended up the exact same way. But that's who knows what would have happened there because the fight didn't happen. And what a bummer it was to not see uh, Derek Lewis on the card. But what a reality check it was because that shows how high level these fighters are. Fabrizio Verdum has been at the top for... For almost a decade, not quite a decade, but for a long time, he's been at the top. And he's fought some of the best fighters of all time, submitting them. He submitted Pedro Emelianenko. He submitted Minotaro Nogueira. He submitted Cain Velasquez. Three greats of the heavyweight division. He was on top. He got clipped by by uh, uh, Stipe Miocic. And he had a, I thought he won his fight against uh, Alistair Overeem. That fight was close. And he beat Alistair as well. I think he submitted him. Um and that was a good reality check to show how high level these fighters are. Walt Harris, on five hours' notice, took a chance. A, a, a Hail Mary, beyond all Hail Marys. Hail Mary from the 99 yard line. I, I couldn't imagine any situation besides him clipping him in the first minute uh, that Walt Harris would have won. But that was interesting, too. That kind of added a little bit of intrigue in the card as well. A little bit of you know shock, a little bit of disbelief. I was excited to see that Tony or that uh, Fabrizio Verdun was still on the card. You know, it was such a bummer that that fight got called off, but I was still happy to see him on the card. And he just cut through him like butter. He just cut through him like butter. I wanted to say that Walt Terrace had a shot, and he kind of did because anything could happen in the heavyweight division. But once you get on the ground. That's a reality check of how incredible Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is and how dominant of a force that is. Uh, it, it's it's clear that Jiu-Jitsu, when you get someone on the ground, it doesn't matter about your power. It doesn't really matter about how hard you can hit. It's all about how skilled you are on the ground, and that's what we saw. It was Fabrizio Verdum cutting through him like butter. It was a beautiful move that he had. He took the back, ended up taking, an, taking the arm, and got the arm bar so quickly. And you can just see uh, Walt Harris, he's like, man... I took a shot against one of the greatest fighters of all time. What an honor it was. It fell short. Darn. And that's, what can you do? You fought the greatest fighter of all time. That would have taken you a de- that would have taken you years to get up to that level on a, on a, your best winning streak. It would have taken you years to get up to that level. So what an honor it was for Walt Harris. And that was, he got pay-per-view points for it. He got on the pay-per-view, fought one of the biggest draws in the UFC at, at, at this moment. So what an honor it was for him. So that was very interesting. Okay, so to wrap things up, I wanted to go through the future of the UFC, what we got going on, uh, the rest of 2017, and it we're ending this we're ending the year strong. We, we kind of struggled a little bit at the start. We didn't really have high level uh, fights, but we're, we're we're ending it pretty hard with uh, 
Cowboy Cerrone versus I still don't I don't know this guy. They're ta- they're hyping him up against Darren Till. 15 and 0, 15 and 0. Undefeated. He's got one draw. And one another thing I would I would like to mention, John Blockwich versus Devin Clark. Devin Clark is actually a really good friend of mine. He trains here in Sioux Falls. Right now he's training in Albuquerque, New Mexico at Jackson Wink MMA. But he, he trains at uh, Next Edge Academy as well. So good friend of mine. He's fighting on the UFC Fight Pass main card. So that's a huge honor for him. Uh, he's fighting in Poland. Poland. So that's interesting as well. But do, number six ranked Donald Stroni versus Darren Till. Um, we're kind of kept in the closet here. I don't really know what to expect. Darren Till is facing a killer in Donald Cerrone. What an honor it is it is for him in his first UFC fight to be fighting Donald Cowboy Cerrone. What an honor that is for him. And what Donald Cerrone fighting in Poland on a UFC Fight Pass card? That just doesn't seem... Uh, he'll fight anyone for any amount of money. And he just loves fighting. It doesn't matter. It just seems weird that they're giving him a fight in Poland on the UFC Fight Pass. That just seems strange. But to be fair, Michael Bisping fought Anderson Silva on UFC Fight Pass. So that's interesting as well. So that is Saturday, October 21st. I will try to have a podcast out for that uh, at least by Wednesday. By the way, I'm going to stop doing the the videos. Uh, I'm going to stop doing the cutting in and out. It's just way too much editing, and it's just really inefficient for me. It turned out really good. I was very happy with it, but it's just way too much work. It took me... 12 plus hours to get that done when you add the notes, add the editing. So the next fight on the live on FS1, October 28th, Saturday, it is um, number seven ranked Derek Brunson versus uh, Leoto Machida. He's unranked in the 185 pound division. That's interesting. And we got Damian Maya facing Colby Covington, Mark Mu- Pedro Munoz versus Rob Font, Jim Miller's on that card. Uh, Tiago Santos, uh, John Lineker's on that card. Um, very good card coming up there, the 28th. And that's on FS1 as well. And then the big fight, live at the Madison Square Garden in New York City. Live on pay-per-view, one of the best cards ever. That Certainly the best card this year. Champion Michael Bisping versus George Rush, St. Pierre. Cody Garbrandt versus TJ Dillashaw. Yanni Yen Jacek versus Rose Diamond Yunus. And Steven Thompson versus Jorge Masvidal. What a card that will be. I am most excited for that card. Anytime they go to the Madison Square Garden, when they have Michael Bisming, when they have Joanna Young Jacek, and they have the rivalry between Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw, I'm going to be interested. And the undercard is not, not as great as the undercard the last time they went to uh, last time they went to New York, but it's still kind of a stacked undercard. We got... Um, I can't even announce these guys' name. Ricardo Ramos versus uh, Amin Zahabi. We got Alexi Olenek versus Cur- Curtis Blades. Now, that's a good fight. That's on the F- UFC Fight Pass early prelims. Let's see. We got James the Executioner Vic versus Joe Duffy. That is a fantastic fight. And those people are both unranked. That is a fantastic fight. And that's headlining FS1 prelims. Uh, Johnny Hendricks is fighting a guy that I can't even pronounce his name. I've never heard of him before. Making his UFC debut. Johnny Hendricks back in the octagon training at Jackson's Wink. That'd be interesting as well. And just an all-around good card, but the main card is nothing to mess with. That main card is absolutely stacked. Absolutely stacked. On par with the event last year at the Madison Square Garden, but I'm not sure if you could top that. And then we got Dustin Poirier versus uh, Sh- um, Showtime Pettis. Mark Hunt versus, who is that? I did a podcast on him once. Marcin Tibera, that's going to be an interesting fight as well. Marcin Tibera is ranked number eight. That's kind of interesting because I, I last when I did a podcast on him, I think it was unranked at the time. And then Anderson Silva versus Calvin Gastelum. That's in China, of all places, at the Mercedes-Benz Arena in Shanghai, China. That's really cool, and that's on UFC Fight Pass. Uh, that's a great fight. And then... Your Ultimate Fighter finale. I haven't been keeping up with this uh, last Ultimate Fighter. And UFC 218 is headlined by Max Holloway versus Frankie Edgar. And then we got TBD versus TBD, TBD versus TBD. And then to end the year, UFC 219, Saturday, December 30th at Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. Uh, headlined by TBA and uh, TBD. I'm thinking that it's going to be Conor McGregor versus uh, Tony Ferguson. But anyway... That will wrap it up. Uh, very interesting uh, future for the UFC. Very interesting event. What a great event it was. Let's just take an event by event. 
Uh, I will certainly be having more content out. I, I've been working really hard lately. So if you like this, for sure, because I haven't done a post-fight press, I haven't done a post-fight podcast since early days. I think UFC, I don't even know. I didn't even do it for UFC 207, my first podcast. I think I did it for the next one. It was Penn versus Rodriguez. I did UFC Fight Path, or the UFC uh, Fight Night Phoenix. I did one after that, and that was the only one I've ever done. This is the second one I've ever done. I had some co topics I wanted to cover, so I'm happy I got over those. I wonder if I'll cut those uh, to make multiple videos of those. But anyway, I've been talking for too long. I'll wrap this up. This is Tyler Burke from T-Bone MMA, and I will catch you guys later.